Hello, I'm Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, Pfizer's Chief Patient Officer. You know, at Pfizer, we are committed to developing and bringing to market breakthroughs that change patients' lives, whether that's for infectious threats like COVID-19, illnesses like cancer, or other health conditions that impact people's lives. You know, core to our approach is a steadfast belief in science. And you might ask why? It's because science has gotten us thus far. It's brought us significant advances in medical treatments without which many people, myself included, a 23 year and counting breast cancer survivor, might not be alive today. It's also brought us vaccines and preventive medications that can help stop a disease from occurring and or decrease its impact. And science has allowed us to better understand the how and the why of disease spread. But certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has made it crystal clear that our work is far from over. And I think it's safe to say that many of us are counting on science to take us further. As the human pursuit for answers continues, so does the quest for empirical, replicable science. And building on Pfizer's Science Will Win campaign that you may have seen on TV, we as Pfizer leaders are sitting down with experts to hear firsthand what Science Will Win means to them. We also want to gain insights into the steps that these leaders are taking to address the many challenges they are facing. And we wanna know what they're doing to decrease the negative impacts of coronavirus. And I'm so excited that today I have the great honor of being joined by Dr. Gary Puckran, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Minority Equality Forum, a not-for-profit organization that addresses the need for strengthening national and local efforts to use evidence-based, data-driven initiatives to guide programs to eliminate the disproportionate burden of premature death and preventable illnesses for racial and ethnic minorities and other special populations. So Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, how are you doing? I'm great, how about you? I'm doing well, doing well. So let's dive right in. Um, you know, a National Minority Quality Forum works with various community groups from around the world, around the country in fact, um, and now given the spread of COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact it's having on communities of color, can you just talk us through uh, some of the challenges that you're hearing from uh, your partners on the ground? This virus is presenting so many different kinds of challenges uh, to the American community, particularly minority community. There's a great need, certainly in the minority community, for testing. Uh, we need to make sure that those who uh, are symptomatic or even asymptomatic uh, have an opportunity to be uh, tested. Uh, besides testing, uh, we need to understand why we're seeing this disproportionate outcome uh, in African Americans and Hispanic populations. African Americans have a fourfold uh, higher risk of mortality uh, and hospitalizations uh, than than do others. Uh, at the at the outset, the thought was that it was comorbid conditions like asthma, hypertension, uh, diabetes uh, that was driving these outcomes. But there have been recent studies to show that, no, it's not these comorbid conditions. Uh, there may be something else going on. And so there's a real need for science to get in there and try to understand uh, why we're seeing these, uh, uh, these real uh, poor outcomes. That's absolutely true. We, we have to get to the root of it. But um, you, you talked a little bit about some of the solutions. Um, what other solutions do you think we need? First of all, we need a national strategy. We need to come together and decide that uh, these risk populations, uh, we need to understand what their challenges are, starting with testing, uh, also uh, the underlying science. At the National Minority Quality Forum, uh, what we've been doing is we've launched a five-year study uh, to understand the virus. Uh, we're collecting samples on 5,000 minority patients around the, the country. And the reason why we're doing it for five years, because it's not just um, the fact that they get infected or may have a poor outcome, but the data says that patients may have long-term uh, consequences from the disease, like pulmonary fibrosis, attack on the, on the kidney and heart. And so uh, we need to follow these patients uh, for quite a while to get a good understanding of the impact of the, of the virus on them. That's certainly for sure. The, the virus is, has had an incredibly 
disproportionate impact in many communities, and it's it's not doesn't appear to be short term, which is which is devastating. So glad to see that uh, we're going to be looking long term. Um, I know that even before coronavirus, um, you and your organization were collecting healthcare status and utilization data by zip codes. Tell me a little bit about that and how you think that might play in and, and help us as we move forward in at looking at health disparities generally. So uh, our organization, what we're focused on is patient risk. Um, when people come into the healthcare system, they expect the healthcare system to lower their risk. I don't know of anyone who goes into a healthcare system expecting that their risk is going to be elevated. Elevated because they didn't get properly diagnosed, elevated because they didn't get access to appropriate therapies, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've been doing is we've been collecting health data, claims data, um, when you go into the healthcare system, you leave a footprint. Um, and that footprint tells us uh, what you were diagnosed for, uh, how you were treated, did you use uh, the treatment, and what did your outcomes look like? And so we collect that data, and the way we're trying to organize it and use it is to help us inform patient risk so that we can look back on practices and uh, patient engagement and say, um, we see problems here that um, can be amended um, so that we can reduce patient risk, we can reduce those hospitalizations, ER visits, mortality rate. It's all driven by the numbers. It's about the science. Well, certainly having the right data is pivotal to helping us understand and, and tackle health disparities. You now, so as we come to the end of our, our, our Q&A, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, Gary, what does science will win mean to you? I find this whole dialogue about science will win in the 21st century that we've already gone to the moon, right? Uh, we're, we're already talking about going to live on Mars and we got to have this conversation about science will win. That was a conversation that we had 200 years ago in the age of enlightenment, the age of reason, where we developed the scientific method. But unfortunately, we have to repeat the message. Um, science is the way in which we learn. Science is the way in which we can improve our survivability. There isn't anything else. It's science that has to uh, be at the forefront of everything that we do. Well, you know what, like you, Gary, we at Pfizer believe that science will win and, and science is really the best tool we have to improve human life at every level from individual comfort to more global issues. So. I want to say thank you, uh, Gary, for, for your comments. Uh, they're all very well said. Uh, that's unfortunately all the time we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this Science Will Win discussion. And a special thanks to you, Gary, for joining us. We so appreciate the great work you're doing at the National Minority Equality Forum. And I am confident that with amazing thought leaders like you at the table, we will all win. To those of you at home, please comment below um, why you think uh, that science will win. Thank you. Uh, stay healthy and, and stay well.